My name is Tamsin Russell and I'm the Workforce Lead at the Museums Association. And what I am going to be talking about with India, we're sharing the space, is the Workforce Wellbeing Research. All of this is available on our website, so feel free to delve in more deeply. We're going to speak for about 20 minutes and so make sure we finish at five. So the reason we're here today is we wanted to make sure that we reflected what the, the priorities and the themes were for the conference. And so we felt really encouraged that this was one of the themes around health and well-being. We also know that if we create an environment where people's well-being is prioritised and they feel valued and included, then that has a significant impact on our aspirations and commitment to a more diverse workforce and audience base. What are we going to be talking about today? I'm going to be highlighting the research and campaign aims and then handing over to India, who's going to talk through the key findings and recommendations. I'm going to give you a, a little exercise to do on your way home around creating an individual well-being plan before closing. But equally, if you've got any questions, feel free to use Twitter or email India or myself after the event. Well, there's nothing more than we like, more than um, a, a wee bit of a blether about this stuff. So just in terms of defining our terms, this is how we define well-being at the Museums Association. And we acknowledge that it is around our well-being at work and at home, and that there is flow between both of those. So it's very hard to think about our existence of well-being in one particular location or domain of our lives. There is absolute fluidity around this. We also are really clear that for an organisation to be seen as being functional, it should aspire to have and be committed to a healthy workforce in terms of both psychological and physical well-being. Yet we see most often in our sector the prioritisation of physical well-being, how many people have gone on manual handling training, how many have got cosh assessments, but perhaps less so on emotional or psychological well-being. So one of our really important campaign areas, which is around fair work, inclusivity, well-being and positive fair working conditions. And if any of that gets you excited, feel free to visit our website because we do have uh, dedicated campaign pages and resources around all of these areas and are always looking for additional areas to explore. So just in the same way that Matt said, if there's not a network that meets your needs, create one. If there's an area of work or research into workforce experience or more broadly anything to do workforce then please let us know we may not be able to do it today but we can factor it in for our future plans so what were our well-being research aims we really wanted to and this research took place in summer of 2022 to identify very clearly what the picture of well-being was this came as a result of us coming out of the pandemic where there was a huge focus on well-being and we wanted to do a snapshot just to see where everybody was we also wanted to highlight the factors that were important we know that we're time poor we're resource poor so if i'm a small museum manager of a small organisation, where do I invest my time and energy to improve the well-being and the experience of my workforce? So we wanted to identify what those factors were and to be able to drill all of that into what does that mean in terms of actual practice and recommendations, which leads me nicely on to our commitment as part of our wellbeing campaign. So having looked at the research and we've got over 650 responses to our workforce questionnaire last summer, what we are now in the process of doing is rolling out the campaign and the interventions associated with it. And so that is around raising awareness of wellbeing as being an important issue for the sector. It's about providing advice and support for those within the sector, as well as programmes and case studies so that you can think, what can I do now and how can I improve it? I'm now going to hand it over to India, who's going to talk through some of the more granular findings and recommendations. Over to you, India. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, so you can, uh, like Tamsin said, you can find all of the key findings and recommendations from our wellbeing research on the Museums Association website. So I'm not going to uh, tell you all of them in full today. I'll just go through some highlights um, uh, and that'll help with the timing, I think, as well. Um, so uh, from our key findings, um, 
uh, a majority of respondents uh, reported a good life satisfaction, uh, but a majority of respondents also reported a less good or significantly low work satisfaction. So we can see there that there's a bit of a problem around uh, well-being in the sector. Um, the key factors affecting uh, well-being at work um, related to excessive uh, demands, uh, not feeling recognised and not feeling valued. Um, so uh, respondents were more likely um, to have a positive work satisfaction um, of well-being at team level. Um, so it's clear there that um, line managers and colleagues um, were contributing uh, to this positive experience. And um, there has also been a, a clear shift um, to hybrid working uh, with only 30% reporting um, their role as being on site. Um, so Coming to the recommendations, um, so these recommendations weren't aimed at individual level, um, these are aimed at organisations and managers. Um, so organisations and managers um, should centre well-being proactively uh, in all planning, in, in budgeting, in risk assessment and decision making and ensure that all activities are sufficiently resourced to deliver um, successfully without excessive demands uh, and negative impacts on well-being. Um, organisations and managers um, should develop skills uh, to support um, the well-being of others uh, as part of management programmes, of training and of induction. And, uh, and e explore um, the possibilities of implementing hybrid uh, working and for roles that can only be done on site um, uh, organizations should explore sort of what other possibilities are available so for example um, additional leave or well-being days uh, for those staff such as front of house staff that that have to be on site and can't um, have that hybrid working arrangement thank you india can everyone still hear me yeah wonderful Good job. So those recommendations were centred generically across uh, all different areas of, of museum practice and can easily be used as a, a quick checklist or audit within your own team or organisations. Um, as India said, the recommendations were centred at an organisational level rather than an individual level. And there was a particular reason for that, is too often we feel that organisations level the responsibility for changing well-being at the individual's door. So it's not that we're giving you too much work, it's just you're not very good at time management. It's not that you're really tired, it's just because you're doing too th many things outside of work, it's nothing to do with us. So we didn't want to centre the responsibility for addressing uh, workforce well-being at the individual's door. However, there is some utility in for your own approach, thinking around what you can do for yourself and to get that thought process and those ideas down on paper. What we've done this today, literally at the beginning of Mental Health Awareness Week, is we've published on our website an individual well-being plan with guidance around how to go through it. And I'll show you what that looks like shortly. The reason the individual well-being plan is even more important is when we look at those individuals that work with visitors, audiences and communities. So the three other recommendations that stemmed from this research were specifically around the additional burden, the additional challenge that individuals face when working with marginalised, excluded or um, mistreated groups. And additionally now with the other aspects we've talked about around cost of living, and also um, aspects around energy and all of those things, what we're seeing increasingly are individuals coming into our spaces as well as on our programmes that will be dealing with a, a much uh, bigger additional burden around their own working lives, those austerity measures, et cetera. 
What we highlighted here is if you're working with communities, there is an additional responsibility to support your well-being. So it was really encouraging to, to, to hear from Diana talk about the, the work and the, the therapeutic poet's work. And that's something we think should be built in at grant application stage, as well as prioritised in terms of time and resources and making sure that individuals feel as if they are being fully supported. So if we had time, I would get you to go through a reflective exercise around everything that you've heard today in terms of things that uh, resonate with your working practice, things that you might want to do, things that make you angry, whatever it might be that contributes to affecting your well-being levels. And then begin to think about what does this mean for you? Reminding ourselves that it's not your fault that you're doing 12 things in half a day. It's whoever has set up the strategic plan or operating plan and has removed half the staff at the same time. But there is still some positivity around thinking about your own well-being. So understanding and defining what well-being looks like for you, because it will be different. This is not a homogeneous approach. Everyone's sense of well-being is around your needs and wishes. So I worked yesterday afternoon for a couple of hours. Should I be working at the weekend? No, I shouldn't. Did it help me not have a hideous day this morning? Yes, it did. So working out what your well-being uh, uh, balances is important. Um, and reflect on what affects your well-being. Think about those boundaries, think about those interactions, think about all the things that might have an impact. And we've heard already um, uh, around the factors that affect it. You know, So you might think, is it excessive demands or is it a problematic culture or is it the fact that I don't get paid money? All of our factors affecting our well-being will be different. For you to identify and isolate the ones that are most significant for you will enable you to work out what your next course of action is. And in addition to that, understanding the well-being interventions that your organisations may have in place will enable you to seek those out. I always think it's interesting that often when we need our help about well-being or when we need to raise a grievance or um, make a complaint around our organisation, we're often not in the right place to seek that information out. So seek that information out at first rather than when you need it. So my challenge to you will be to reflect on your experience of work, identify what well-being looks like for you, think about the factors that affect your well-being, and go and have a look at our website, because it's now live, very excited. But we have got a very basic one-pager that enables you to begin to get your thoughts down on paper, and you don't have to share this with anybody. This can literally be the document that enables you to create some distance from what's in here to what's down here to enable you to navigate your next steps. But equally, you might want to choose to use this to have a conversation with your line manager about what they can do, their duty of care to support your well-being, because it isn't your responsibility in its entirety. I'm now going to hand over to India. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, summarise a little bit about the other resources that you can find on our website. So as well as um, the workforce wellbeing uh, research that we've uh, kind of given you some highlights today that you can check out in full there. Uh, we also have our wellbeing hub that provides you with lots of amazing resources to support your wellbeing. And that includes um, the individual wellbeing plan that just went live today. So definitely check that out and, and do the reflective exercise. Um, we've also got a redundancy hub that provides um, resources and support um, if you're going through redundancy. Um, and uh, we uh, ran out uh, uh, museum conversations on workforce wellbeing, and you can find that as well and rewatch it on our website as well. So that's all under uh, the workforce wellbeing um, section of the website under campaigns. So, so definitely check that out. Um, and just to uh, sum up and say thanks very much for listening today. Um, you can find our contact details here if you want to contact us um, with any uh, suggestions of resources you think might be useful or any um, additional questions. Um, but we're also happy to take any questions now. <laughs>